Well, welcome uh, to the Center for Strategic International Studies uh, this morning. We've got a terrific briefing. Um, some of you are just back from your last trip, and, and so uh, um, thanks for uh, being able to do this this morning. Um, we have a terrific briefing. In, in addition, I hope you got copies of uh, Jennifer Cook and Richard Downey's commentary. If not, we can pass them around. It's uh, called President Obama's Africa Trip Making the Business Case. Um, we're going to uh, start off with my colleague Jennifer Cook, who is the director of our Africa program, and then we'll go to um, Richard, who is um, uh, deputy director of the Africa program um, here at CSIS, and then we'll finish up with Steve Morrison, who started our Africa program at CSIS, which then morphed into um, our very well-known Glo Global Health Policy Center um, that uh, Steve launched a few years ago on the heels of our Smart Power Initiative, and it's uh, been an, an incredible um, success and uh, just an amazing um, uh, set of things that he's been studying over the years. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn to my colleague Jennifer. Great. Thanks so much, Andrew, and uh, thanks all for, uh, for joining us today. Um, we thought we'd keep it fairly short so that we can turn as quickly to, as possible to questions and hear kind of the specifics of what you're interested in. But I thought I would start out with the big objectives of the um, President's trip, um, putting it in the context of his Africa policy more generally. Then Richard will talk a little bit about some of the more difficult challenges that may not get highlighted overtly, explicitly um, in a presidential trip. These tend to be very upbeat, um, kind of uh, good, news, good news trips, but there are a lot of underlying challenges there as well. Uh, and then Steve talked to um, the big U.S. assistance programs in food security and health, but also looking back a little bit at the significance of these presidential trips generally. Steve has lived through a number of them uh, over the years. Um, so first and foremost, I think this, th this trip is intended to signal to African governments and to African citizens that the U.S. is prepared to re-engage with Africa, um, that it remains an important and committed partner um, and to overcome a perception that U.S.-Africa policy is kind of been in maintenance mode over the last, um, over, over the President's first term. Obviously, President Obama came to office with big expectations. There was euphoria in Africa over his election um, as the first African-American president who had traveled to Africa, who had uh, African ancestry. Um, it, it came on the heels of a decade of really uh, accelerating momentum on Africa policy, beginning with the Clinton administration's high-profile trips, the Africa Growth and um, Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, um, President Bush exceeding all expectations and making Sudan an immediate priority when he came into office. Uh, then launching the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR, $15 billion initiative, uh, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which focused mostly in Africa, the Africa Command, two high-profile trips. So really, you had this major funding, major attention, major initiatives going to Africa. Um, and then President Obama came in, and there was a, a sense of stall, in a way. I mean, there were understandable reasons for, for that. Uh, he came in the midst of a global economic crisis, a domestic economic meltdown, a Congress that was much more inward-looking, that had generally been very supportive of Africa initiatives in a bipartisan way prior. Um, uh, domestic gridlock on big issues, and then wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and a proliferation of global crises. And Africa just seemed to fall away in terms of excitement, in, in terms of energy and momentum. Um, you know, the U.S. hasn't been entirely idle in, in this time. Um, the, 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 there were big sustaining commitments on the big global health, uh, uh, on the global health initiatives. There were some diplomatic successes early on uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Guinea, in, in getting Sudan to the, um, to the referendum uh, for the Southern Sudanese independence. But those were kind of collaborative efforts done in concert with, with African governments and regional bodies that, that didn't, you know, the U.S. wasn't going to take full credit for them. And they weren't big, splashy initiatives that got people's attention, either in Africa or, or here at home. 
and no big money and no, no big ideas that really helped define what Obama was about in Africa. Meanwhile, I think the African context has been changing fairly dramatically. Um, the economic growth story, probably many of you know, five to six percent average growth rates over the last decade. Africa weathered the economic crisis uh, far better than anyone anticipated. High commodity prices, sustained high demand from China and others. Uh, growth in new, new industries, in telecommunications, in construction, in transportation, in banking, uh, those actually drove, in wholesale and retail, those actually drove some of the big growth rates that we saw. The rise of a consumer class, I wouldn't say necessarily a full-fledged middle class, but a consuming class at least. Better economic management by a number of governments. Now Africa sits on the edge of a uh, front edge of a hydrocarbons boom with big new natural gas finds, world class size natural gas finds off the coast of Mozambique, Tanzania, new, exp new oil exploration in the east coast and in, in new oil producers in the west coast, Ghana, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Mauritania, and new technologies that are expanding the reserves of the big producers, Angola, Nigeria, um, Gabon, and so forth. Um, other countries have been taking note of this. Um, China, Malaysia, India, Brazil, Turkey, they are all there very actively seeking out investment opportunities. So Africa has become a much more competitive uh, playing field commercially and, and along with that diplomatically as well in terms of the big ideas on growth, on human rights norms and democracy norms, climate change, and the big global issues, they play a more important role in international fora on those. So this Africa rising narrative is taking increasing hold, and I think the president will speak to those opportunities. I, I think he'll also speak, and it's worth challenging the Africa rising narrative a little bit, because not all countries will benefit from, from this. Uh, some countries are not part of that rise, and there's a danger uh, that without accountable governments, without strategic vision, without sound revenue management, um, that that growth does not translate into sustained economic development um, uh, that drives manufacturing, that drives diversification of economies, that leads to beneficiation of, of raw commodities, employment or service delivery. So in this context, I think the big themes of the trip will be, first, and foremost, the big new theme will be elevating uh, U.S. economic engagement with Africa, getting a broader swath of the U.S. private sector interested and educated on the opportunities on the continent. Um, right now, these, the companies active in Africa tend to be the big extractive energy industry and, the, and some of the major corporate giants, GE, um, IBM, Boeing, and so forth. Um, but I think the president is trying to mobilize a much broader swath of U.S. Uh, smaller and small and medium-sized enterprises to, to come into Africa, and getting strengthening agencies like the Exim Bank, OPIC, um, USTDA uh, to play a bigger role. Second, we'll be targeting some of the big obstacles to investment um, and sustained growth on the continent. So strengthening institutions will be a big theme, accountable governments, technical capacities, and a major announcement is expected in Tanzania on um, strengthening, on partnerships for power generation and distribution. Electrification in Africa has been one of the primary stumbling blocks to investment and to sustained economic growth. And it's, it's, the, one of the, it's probably the number one obstacle that investors face when they go in is that they can't get enough electrical power and have to pay huge amounts in terms of generation, uh, generators and, and diesel costs. A third will be making the case uh, of the U.S. comparative advantage in this arena. Um, I don't think he'll mention China explicitly uh, because you don't want to define U.S. engagement in terms of, of, of China, but he will want to make a case of why, why U.S. makes a good partner in this, uh, in investment. U.S. firms tend to bring technology transfer, knowledge transfer, training, 
maintenance packages, quality brand recognition, a whole slew of things that other international competitors don't necessarily bring. China, you know, China has a mixed record in Africa, but gets criticized for kind of lack of transparency, bringing its own workers, bringing its own materials, um, not engaging with the communities around them. And I think the President will want to make that distinction of why the U.S. is a good partner in this regard. Uh, and finally, the democracy and governance, um, institution building, and again, engagement beyond the government, which the U.S. tends to do better than some of these other new partners. Um, you know, this, this won't be entirely a commercial trip, and I think the U.S. will want to emphasize that democratic principle, democratic consolidation um, remains a core value of the United States and a core uh, foreign policy objective. And his choice of countries, Senegal, which came through, we can talk a little bit more in Q&A on the specific countries. Senegal came through what may have been an electoral, what was heading towards an electoral crisis last year, came through a kind of a real demonstration of how embedded democratic principles can keep, keep the process on track. Um, Tanzania, generally well governed. They're actually experiencing some interesting political tensions right now that will be worth exploring. Uh, and South Africa, messy but democratic, having gone through, obviously, the, the historic transformation. Um, I'll stop there and we can get into more detail in the Q&A. Um, but uh, Richard, why don't you talk a little bit about the security aspects? Yeah, so uh, Jennifer's done the upside, the opportunity side of the trip. I'm, as a European, more comfortable talking in gloomy terms about downside <laughs> things. So uh, let's talk about uh, security uh, first of all, then I'll kind of highlight one of the big policy challenges that the U.S. has and, uh, in, in Africa. So security, um, is, it's no secret that U.S. security interests are on the rise uh, in Africa. Um, you know, largely due to the threat of uh, violent extremist uh, organizations and, and their sort of uh, expansion into regions that, that were previously unaffected. Um, U.S. security stakes, I guess, have been rising for quite a while in, in Africa. You know, think back to the early 90s when Osama bin Laden was uh, took up residence in Sudan and uh, uh, really, Al Qaeda became a household name over here on the back of the the big uh, uh, U.S. embassy attacks in Kenya and Tanzania, all the way back in, in 1998. Um, but as I say, the terrorist threat has expanded a, a little bit of, of late. Uh, the big area of expansion really is the Sahel uh, region. Uh, this sort of band of very weak, undergoverned, uh, and poorly governed uh, states. Um, U.S. Africa Command, AFRICOM, uh, has been warning for quite a while now of, of growing links between these uh, extremist organizations such as AQIM, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic uh, Maghreb, uh, and Boko Haram, this uh, group in, in northern Nigeria. Uh, and documents found uh, recently in Mali in the aftermath of the, the, the um, uh, conflict there uh, seem to back up uh, these claims, although we shouldn't overstate them and, and present uh, these groups as sort of one part, you know, some part of a massive networked arc of instability that, that sort of sweeps across Africa, I think. Um, there's also concern, and again, not that much substantial evidence, but certainly uh, some concern uh, that these uh, extremist groups are colluding with uh, some of the transnational organized crime networks that um, smuggle illicit and illicit goods uh, through the Sahel uh, region have done for, uh, for sort of time immemorial. Um, and a lot of these groups, AQIM being one example, it's actually often quite hard to separate the criminal from the terrorist uh, activities that these groups engage with. So anyway, these rising f threats uh, combined with the drawdown in Afghanistan and elsewhere has, has led to sort of speculation that Africa is becoming a theater of expansion for uh, the U.S. military. Uh, and certainly in, in recent months, we've seen uh, some evidence of increased activity. Uh, the newly established uh, drone base in Niger, for example, uh, next door to Mali, uh, for unarmed, at the moment, predator drones. Um, and certainly, really beginning with the Libya intervention uh, in 2011, AFRICOM has sort of shed some of its earlier uh, activities which were very focused on soft power and uh, development type work and they've become much more of a sort of traditional competent command focused on the operational uh, side of things. Um, 
so as I say, the threat level has risen, but we, we have to put it into perspective. Um, you know, groups like AQIM, uh, Mujao, um, Boko Haram, they, they certainly uh, uh, undermine U.S. development and governance objectives in Africa, but I think it's highly debatable whether they pose a direct threat uh, to the U.S. homeland uh, right now. Um, that's, that's because they have pretty limited capacity, um, um, and some... Uh, in fact, most uh, are primarily focused on other enemies, enemies closer to home, and Boko Haram would be a, a prime example of, of that. So I think it will take a serious sort of threat escalation to overcome U.S. reluctance to commit combat troops, for example, in Africa. And that's a stance that's been, that's been pretty constant since uh, the intervention in Somalia back in, in, in 93. Um, so really, if you look at this, this year's uh, military campaign by the French in Mali, the U.S. role sort of fits that pattern, that historical pattern. Uh, it was a non-combat role. It was a support role. Um, and really, that was despite uh, a lot of countries in the region directly appealing for, for the United States to, to play more of a robust military role. So the, the strong uh, uh, desire, I think, is low profile, avoid putting boots uh, on the ground. Um, that said, there is, I think, a slight danger of, of mission creep as you, in Africa as you get sort of you know, drone bases and drone activity, for example, uh, cranking up. Um, perhaps a bigger problem as well is, is, is this sort of tendency or, or, or concern that the U.S. might begin to sort of favor security solutions or military solutions uh, over problems which at their root cause uh, are, are down to sort of development challenges and political challenges. Uh, so what would, for example, if Niger, Niger fell to some of the armed groups who, who caused so much chaos in, in Mali, which is not that far-fetched a scenario, what would the U.S., you know, would the U.S. feel obliged to step in is, is, a, is an open question. Um, in, the, in the rare events where offensive operations are considered necessary, where U.S. citizens are uh, at threat, uh, the preference, I think, will be for these sort of light uh, it's kind of light footprint operations using special uh, forces, special operations forces, you know, acting on intelligence provided by drones. The Benghazi attack uh, obviously uh, uh, focused minds on this issue, um, particularly the need to improve response times to uh, attacks and threats against U.S. citizens so that you've had this rapid reaction uh, capability that's uh, now going to be provided by uh, Marines stationed in, in uh, southern Spain. Um, that said, I think the overall mission of AFRICOM will be on the sort of building up capacity of, of African militaries, because the end goal here is that Africans really will be dealing with their own security problems in the long term, rather than relying on the US or, or more recently France to come in and bail them out. Um, you know, how, that, uh, how best to do that military engagement is, is uh, a big question that's worth asking, I think. And, and there's been uh, a degree of soul-searching about the approach that was taken in uh, Mali, for example. Um, you know, Mali's military was formerly a big recipient of uh, U.S. training programs, uh, but when the uh, original uh, Tuareg-led MNLA uh, uprising began in the north, the Malian military collapsed, uh, a lot of the soldiers defected, uh, and, uh, and one of its uh, members led a coup which sort of tipped Mali into this uh, even bigger crisis, and, and this was a, a guy who received U.S. military training. So, I mean, it's, it's, there's no easy answers to how you prevent these sort of rogue elements, but I think, it, you know, it, it appears that this train-and-equip model is, is not sustainable without a meaningful institutional reform as well. Uh, you know, uh, and the previous commander of AFRICOM emphasized that the need to sort of do more work on human rights and ethics uh, to sort of drum home the message in its training to militaries that they should be subordinate to civil authority. That message clearly isn't sticking in uh, some countries in Africa right now. Um, on to a, 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 a different a policy challenge, I think, a broader policy challenge that the U.S. faces in Africa, and that's the difficulty uh, it faces in terms of operationalizing what publicly it states as, it, as its number one objective in Africa, and that's promoting good governance and democracy. Um, all the way back, it seems a long time ago, in 2009, when President uh, Obama uh, uh, set foot in, in sub-Saharan Africa the last time he made a speech in the Ghanaian parliament and a uh, nice speech, the big sort of takeaway take line was Africa doesn't need strong men, it needs strong institutions. 
Um, you know, I think he, he hit on, on the, the correct issue that's holding Africa back, uh, uh, poor governance. But, you know, this is, there's a danger, I think, in, in, in placing a sort of essentially a values-based uh, democracy and governance agenda at the pinnacle of Africa policy because, you know, you're setting yourself pretty tough goals to, to attain there. Uh, there are multiple uh, and fairly obvious challenges, but, you know, perhaps one of the, the main ones is how you put together coherent policy for, you know, this incredibly diverse continent, 54 countries and strung across a, a very wide spectrum in terms of governance from pretty good performers on the one end to uh, complete out-and-out -out dictatorships uh, on the other. Um, there's also, of course, the risk, you know, U.S. Uh, policy is not made in a vacuum, particularly in, in Africa, and, and other uh, uh, external actors, maybe China, uh, may undercut your policy. Uh, uh, you know, it's all very well, well and good, the U.S. putting conditions on its engagement with uh, sort of backsliding governments but uh, to encourage reform. But if uh, China just goes in and offers business, no strings attached, then, uh, you know, the U.S. is left sort of standing on the sidelines uh, feeling a bit frustrated. Um, then you have the sort of uh, the clash, the dilemmas that happen when sort of policy principles rub up against the sort of real world uh, realities. And that, uh, that leaves the US open to accusations of double standards, for example, in places like uh, Uganda and Rwanda and Ethiopia, even where uh, you have uh, very close relationships the US is sustaining with uh, authoritarian leaders but who are uh, leaders that are deemed useful in other areas, such as uh, security cooperation or development, uh, achieving development goals. Um, and then finally, there's the, there's the challenge of how the US engages effectively with this sort of fairly large group still of Africa's very poorly governed authoritarian states. You know, do you stand back uh, and lose any leverage that you, you might, might have uh, enjoyed? Uh, such as in Sudan, uh, or do you try and engage in the hope, uh, e even though nothing ever seems to get any better, such as uh, in the Congo, for example? Um, you know, the administration's still grappling with this, I think. Uh, the emerging strategy seems to be one that uh, it doesn't de emphasize uh, uh, democracy, but it, it maybe adopts a more uh, overt f focus on governance and the technical sides and aspects of governance, um, uh, favoring of, uh, working with. African governments to improve efficiency and competence and building institutions. Um, so I think you'll, you'll hear during the trip perhaps some announcements uh, on new in, uh, initiatives to strengthen uh, some of the most failing of African institutions, uh, the, the judiciary, um, police uh, in Africa, uh, uh, to give you uh, two examples. And then the other approach, I think, is perhaps to appeal uh, over the heads of some of the more unreceptive governments and, and seek engagement, as Jennifer mentioned before, with a sort of broader set of constituencies, whether it's uh, young people and women, which are always sort of buzzwords in, in uh, uh, US approach to, to Africa, but also sort of uh, entrepreneurs, business people, and, uh, and, and a real attempt to sort of identify the next generation of African leaders. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there and, and pass over to, uh, to Steve. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming this morning. Um, I'm going to say a few words about some of the past travel, presidential, and also Obama's own personal travel, and then I'm going to offer a few comments on the trip itself and what the trip may mean. Um, President Obama, just to remind you, you know, in, in, when he was newly elected to the Senate, uh, went to Africa uh, in August of '06, um, visited Kenya. Djibouti, which was a counterterrorism trip visit, South Africa and Chad, which was Chad was largely around Darfur. Um, and during that trip, he was pretty aggressive and pretty vocal about corruption and ethnic divisions in Kenya. Uh, he, he and Michelle took a public HIV test while there to counter stigma, visited Kibera, the largest slum in Nairobi. This was part of his uh, gaining his uh, his foreign policy credibility. It was an tr early trip. Uh, Jennifer briefed him uh, before and after that trip. Uh, many of his key people, like Dennis McDonough and, and uh, Mark Lippert, were involved in that. Um, I think it was an important trip. You jump forward to July of, of, of 2009, the Ghana Accra speech, which was a drop-in after the G8. Uh, the speech was meant to be, I think, a companion to the Cairo speech 
And it was very broad and it was very much about good governance and it was very much a message of Africa needs to take, take charge of its own future and, and, and get out of a dependency mentality. Important of strong inst democratic institutions. We're not talking about strong men and, and, and new leadership. We're talking about um, getting your act together uh, as a basis for stability and prosperity. It was a, again, it was a, it was a fairly, in some level, it was a fairly bland speech, but it, was, but it had some pretty strong points to it. Um, in looking back at some of the earlier presidential trips, the, certainly in the Clinton era, the trips, the folks that involved in, who were involved in organizing, conceptualizing those trips, some of those same people are involved in this trip. Uh, the first big one was in March, April, 98. It was a six-country trip. The large concept around the trip was that Africa has uh, a renaissance underway under new leadership. Um, that proved to be um, a somewhat a misbegotten concept uh, for that because uh, shortly after that, um, Eritrea and Ethiopia went to war with one another uh, and, uh, and DRC began to fall apart in armed conflict. Um, there was also in that trip the uh, a sort of quick, unexpected, or unprogrammed visit to Rwanda that was not on the official schedule, where um, this where uh, President Clinton landed uh, on the tarmac and did the did his grand apology around having been uh, uh, passive in the face of the genocide. So that was marked the sort of beginning of trying to come to terms with what happened in '94, '95, the genocide. So it was a it was a trip that started out as a very happy trip but it had a very unhappy component added into it. Um, the uh, next trip that Clinton did, which was uh, in August of 2000, so it was at the end of his tenure, was, was largely Nigeria. It was Nigeria, Tanzania, and Egypt. This was in a period when Obasanjo had come back, democracy had returned to Nigeria. Obasanjo was asserting himself as a continental leader. There was hope yet again that we had some serious leadership that we could ally ourselves with. And, 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 and that was really the central trip, along with recognizing AIDS. In the 98 trip, AIDS didn't figure whatsoever. By 2000, it surfaced as a big issue. Jump forward to Bush's 2003, July 2003, shortly after the in, uh, beginning of the Iraq War, uh, shortly as the PEPFAR program, had, which had been announced in the State of the Union address, in January 2003, um, this was a, a very tense trip. Uh, there was a lot of talk about counterterrorism. Uh, Liberia was lurking out there. Are we? Liberia was in the midst of crisis. There was this grand debate: Are we going to jump in or not? And and and, and we're going to jump in small or jump in big? There was all this tension with, around Zimbabwe when we got to when Bush got to to South Africa. He decided to punt on confronting the South Africans around Zimbabwe and simply. Be deferential. Um, it was it was an it was a new era and a, and a different one. Um, in 2008, February 2008, Bush returns for a second trip to Benin, Tanzania, Rwanda, Ghana, and Liberia, um, in the midst of the Kenyan crisis. And in that period, I think that trip was conceptualized as a celebration trip, as one that the president could go to these places and 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 and, and engage in a dialogue around the many achievements of his tenure, but it occurred in the midst of the Kenya crisis. So it became both a happy trip and a crisis trip. And, um, and, and Condoleezza Rice hived off from that trip to meet up with Kofi Annan in Nairobi and, and attempt to negotiate an end to the internal crisis in Kenya while the president continued on. And when the president came back, President Bush came back, he invited 200 people over to the White House for a slideshow uh, in which it was very clear just how exuberant and engaged and personal this was in terms of his achievements. So those are all by way of background around these trips. There is a tendency on these trips to reach for a positive narrative as the overarching uh, theme. There's also a tendency for reality to crash that. Uh, and, the, and, and in this trip, I think it's less vulnerable to being crashed for reasons that I'll explain. But the we've heard this kind of familiar theme that Africa is on the edge of transformation. It's on the edge of liftoff. It's going to be economic growth that moves it. It's not leadership. It's economic growth. The trip follows from the, presidential's, the president's uh, uh, policy directive on development. 
Uh, if you go, I would urge you all to go read that PDD because much of the TRIPS thematics grow directly from that. Um, it's trying to reposition in the public mind that Africa is a different place uh, in the world and that we should be optimistic, yet we should also control our expectations. In other words, the president is not going to, I think, launch any particularly long, new major initiatives or visions. It's more a, one, a matter of stewardship and re-engagement and signaling that, yes, we care and we're coming back. The expectation from Clinton and Bush is that you do get two, two trips in your tenure to Africa. So this is, a, in some degree, a check-the-box trip. But I think it's more than that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so cynical as to say that is it. There's been an, uh, it, they've chosen three safe places to go, Senegal, Tanzania, and South Africa. Those are good, solid, safe, safe choices. Uh, they're not, they don't have the edge you might get if you'd chosen a few other alternatives. Um, there's a little twist that was added in the announcement that uh, Senator Fein, former Senator Feingold is going to be the envoy to DRC. I think that was timed deliberately in order to, to say, yes, we have not forgotten that, in fact, there are some cruel and difficult crises in this continent, and we're not completely disengaged. It's yet to be determined or defined what that means, uh, but it's an interesting signal that someone as prominent as Senator Feingold has chosen to take this on right before the trip. DRC, does that mean that we, as an administration, as a government, are going to confront Kagame in a new and deliberate way? Uh, at a time when some of Kagami's major backers, Susan Rice most notably, are in prominent positions in this government? It's a good question. I don't think it's going to be answered during this trip. It's a nice touch that they've added that Michelle Obama has committed to join the First Lady's meeting in Tanzania on July 2nd or 3rd with Laura Bush and with Sherry Blair and a, an assembly of, of uh, a very impressive First Ladies from key African countries. I think that's a nice, very nice signal. Is anything going to crash the party? Uh, I don't think you're going to have, you've got the same vulnerabilities. Obviously, President, uh, former President Mandela is very, very ill. We have continued Shabab uh, attacks in Somalia demonstrating that, in fact, the gains made in, 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 in U.S. support, over half a billion dollars of support towards peacekeeping in Somalia remain very, very fragile. Um, overall, I would agree with Richard, uh, the security, U.S. security commitments in this continent, in East Africa and West Africa, have grown substantially, and that's the lead dominant element of U.S. foreign policy uh, on the continent. But what's interesting is it's a fairly quiet and up to now uncontroversial. In other words, the fact that we have two drone bases on this continent doesn't figure too much in the public debate. The fact that AFRICOM five years ago was a source of enormous consternation and contestation within the continent, that's disappeared for the most part. Um, I would also say that the competition with China has moved beyond where it was a few years ago. A few years ago, uh, there was all this, uh, all of these claims that we were in a great clash in competition with China, uh, and that has subsided dramatically. China didn't, and a Africa did not figure at all, as best I know, during the Sunnylands dialogue between the President and, and Xi Jinping. Another thing on terms of security, our oil dependency upon Africa is dropping precipitously as we become much more internally dependent. Ten years ago we were saying we were heading towards 25 to 30 percent dependence upon Africa for energy. That's now in reverse. So that, di that in some ways on the energy, global energy dependence side of things uh, uh, lessens the degree to which we are really looking to the continent as a source of diversified energy support. A few bit quick things on health. In South Africa, you're going to hear a lot about shared responsibility, about ownership, about uh, AIDS-free generation. We just had the 10th anniversary this week of the uh, PEPFAR program. Uh, there was a celebration uh, at the State Department. Secretary Kerry delivered a very eloquent speech, uh, Senator Cardin, Senator Enzi, the Namibian Minister of Health. Um, so this is a big moment in looking back 10 years on the achievements, and I think you'll hear a lot during the trip about the achievements in Tanzania and in South Africa. South Africa is leaning the farthest forward in terms of putting its arms around and making major budgetary commitments on HIV AIDS and other things. And, and we had, that's where the U.S. has made its biggest play. It's put over $4 billion into HIV AIDS. In, in South Africa, it's the single largest investment anywhere in the world outside the United States in health is in South Africa. So please look carefully at that. Polio, I want to just briefly mention, you know, 
We have had polio outbreaks now in southern and central Somalia that seem to be circulating. We've had reports coming out of uh, the, the massive Dadaab camp in northeastern Kenya, and we have reports that samples are appearing in Egypt and Israel. So there's, there's a concern mounting around the spread. The cases in Somalia and, um, uh, and uh, Kenya are traced back to, we think, to Nigerian trainers, military trainers. So as you have breakdown in controls in Nigeria, and, and elsewhere, as you have chaos in, 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 play, in no immunizations in Somalia, you're seeing this resurgence. Food security, the Feed the Future initiative has been the administration's single biggest, this administration's single biggest signature new um, uh, aid initiative. Um, it's reflective of a big shift of consciousness that the food security of the poorest and, and, and uh, countries and the, and the least and the most vulnerable populations is a stability and security concern. Uh, the Feed the Future initiative has weathered bad budget cycles. Um, it, you're, uh, Tanzania is a big partner country in this regard. Senegal to some degree also. You'll hear a lot about that. Electric power is fundamental to trying to get to agro-processing uh, in, in that way. So I'll just close by saying, you know, when you get to South Africa, you'll see also that, you know, this is one of the most fundamental bilateral relationships. Uh, we, and, and it is fraught with tensions. And, it, and, and um, it's a country that's been adrift uh, for some time. But there's a lot of politeness, a lot of polite and deferential engagement. But there's also, um, it's also prone to considerable prickliness on both sides. And uh, it'll be interesting to see where that goes. If, 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 if the end of life for Mandela is hanging over this, obviously that changes the entire atmosphere and tone. Thank you. With that, I'd like to uh, uh, take questions from the audience. If you could identify yourself and speak into the microphone um, so we can get it on the transcript, that'd be great. Uh, let's start with Julie. Thanks. Hi, I'm Julie Pace from the AP. Um, I had two questions. One, you said Obama is going to three pretty safe countries. He's obviously not going to Kenya, uh, where he has family ties. I wanted to um, get your thoughts on why he's not doing that. Is it mostly because of the results of the last election? Um, and do you expect him to address the political situation in Kenya on his other stops on the trip? And then, Stephen, you said that the um, competitiveness with China has changed uh, over the past few years. I'm just curious about why that's happened. Um, on, on the Kenya piece, um, Kenya does seem a, a natural choice in terms of its regional impact, and, and I think there's a couple of countries, I mean, Tanzania and Senegal, while they're well governed, they're not particularly continental superpowers in a way. And, and you know, he's not going to Nigeria, which is uh, the most populous country has a, a strong affinity for the United States on, on, on many issues, has, has big security challenges and, and governance challenges, but is basically democratic. And Kenya, which uh, is, is something of the East Africa's powerhouse, I think there the, that the president and the vice president have been indicted by the International Criminal Court makes it just diplomatically very difficult for, for him to do that. I don't think U.S. engagement with Kenya will change dramatically. I think, first of all, those ICC cases seem to be falling apart a little bit as, as witnesses either die or, or disappear or, or recant. Um, but I think the optics of that, uh, of, of a presidential trip, are not what he wants to be uh, uh, demonstrating right now. As Steve, do you want On to? On the China piece? Um, a couple of things. I think that the, um, the negative impacts that were predicted several years ago were ex grossly exaggerated. Um, and the positive impacts were underestimated. And so some of the more careful careful um, analyses, like Deborah Brodigam's work, Deborah at Johns Hopkins University, has, has brought a much more nuanced sort of appreciation um, of, of this. I think the Chinese themselves made adjustments in their approaches to be um, a little um, a more consultative and more sensitive to uh, to the concerns that they heard on the continent because they were beaten up badly, particularly by the South Africans at multiple points. And keep in mind, I mean, the, the Premier and the President of China are making two, three trips a year. I mean, the level of engagement and contact 
is at a very high tempo and it's been that way for some time. So they've had to learn and listen uh, very carefully and take the criticisms that have come their way. I think that um, their entry into oil markets didn't displace us. Uh, they don't have the technological depth or, 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 or capacities that we have, but they, their entry into the markets did help, uh, I think, uh, intensify the playing field, intensify the marketplace. It was not a negative impact. Uh, on Sudan, where we, where we had lots of abrasions around um, uh, uh, Bashir and that regime and the southern crisis and the movement towards uh, independence for the southern Sudan, the Darfur crisis, there actually was some movement in terms of finding points of collaboration. It was not a, it was not a um, uh, uh, something uh, deep and confrontational. You never really got to the point like you are in the South China Seas, where, you know, you have uh, states caught in a in a in a, in a mashup uh, between themselves and China, with the U.S. acting a asking themselves, okay, where do we go and what do we do here? So um, I think that uh, they become a more normalized presence, and. Um, and, and, and we go about doing our business, and I think they're part of the wallpaper. Uh, you know, it, I don't think that uh, everybody's running around with their hair on fire about China the way they were five or six years ago. Although, although you know, it's worth noting in, in Hillary Clinton's trip, you know, she, she kind of took a snipe at, at China and neo-mercantilist neo uh, strategies. Secretary of State Kerry, one of the first things he, he said on Africa, in addition to saying something about Joseph Kony, was that China is out investing us. Um, so they, they are, you know, it, it has kind of spurred the U.S., and I think that still is an undercurrent, even if it's subsided somewhat. It's worth looking at some of the African pushback on China's president, presence. Um, there's a Great, oh, great piece. An interesting piece in the Financial Times by the Nigerian Central Bank uh, uh, president, who's you know a, a very significant guy, um, talking about kind of a critique of China's engagement and the Chinese president's visit in March. It's worth looking at that text too, since he's he's trying to allay some of the African fears on how China does business in terms of. Um, you know, bringing raw commodities back to China rather than beneficiating them on site. Okay, yeah, let's go to Margaret. Thanks. Um, uh, Margaret Talib with Bloomberg. So, um, Stephen, you had said that uh, if the end of life for Mandela is hanging over it, it obviously changes the atmosphere. Could you, could Jennifer and Stephen talk about um, what you see as the kind of Obama-Mandela narrative part of this trip? Um, whether you think Obama and Mandela haven't had as strong a connection as, as Mandela and Clinton, primarily because of Mandela's aging and, de and decline, or because it's a policy thing and Obama has not been focusing on Africa. Um, so I guess I sort of want to explore the Obama-Mandela uh, thing. I'm wondering if, Jennifer, you can talk about in 06 when you briefed then Senator Obama, whether you guys talked about Mandela then at the time. Uh, and if we have time, uh, Richard, do you think that the security stuff really plays directly into this trip? I mean, he's, he'll be in sub-Saharan Africa. He's not really, he's not going to the Sahel, you know, all that sort of stuff. Thanks. Um, you know, in, in many ways, U U.S. perceptions of South Africa are, are kind of hinge on Mandela and Mandela's legacy and the transformation that took place. And everything is gauged against that transition. And I think there is a worry um, here, but also in, um, in South Africa, in segments of South Africa, that, the, that Mandela's legacy is waning. I think the US has been frustrated a number of times at uh, global positions that South Africa has taken, whether on Myanmar, on nuclear proliferation, on, on a variety of issues, on Zimbabwe, on certain continental issues. I think the expectation in the wake of Mandela's presidency was that South Africa's, uh, South Africa's foreign policy would be based on human rights principles, and that hasn't always proven to be the case. And, and the levels of corruption and kind of uh, foment within the African, uh, African National Congress and within South Africa more generally, I think is, is, is kind of, you're seeing that legacy waning over time. Um, I think 
m much of the reason is that Mandela has been very ill and, and, and fading over the last four years. And he's, uh, you know, he's withdrawn. He made an explicit commitment to withdraw from, from public life. And I think he's, he's been ill and more, in, in, more secluded than previously. He was very critical of the Bush administration, uh, vocally critical of the Bush administration and so forth. And a lot of, and I think that kind of, as, as Steve said, that prickly relationship will come up again. And there are talks of protests against Obama, but I, um, in terms of the drone policy and so forth, the NSA uh, revelations and, and, and so forth. And you know, people are very aware of those things here. Overall, though, I think there remains a, a, a large reservoir of goodwill towards Obama in, in South Africa, whatever the punditry and the internal ANC left left wing uh, 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 feel. Stevie, um, I neglected to mention that you know Michelle Obama was in South Africa in June of '11 with her mother and her daughters, so there are three generations, and there was a dramatic and very moving session at Regina Mundi at the church, um, and the. Um, the reception, we were in South Africa shortly after that visit, and it was striking how much goodwill and respect this generated across the spectrum of South Africans who, you know, diverse South Africans who might otherwise have taken a kind of harsher look at American intentions. I mean, it was something that connected. Um, and, um, and was seen as genuine and interesting. And, um, the, um, uh, I think we entered the post-Mandela phase in South Africa quite a long time ago. Um, and um, uh, we, we, at the time of his passing, I think there'll be an enormous, you know, there'll be an enormous amount of attention and commentary and reflection on the meaning that this man's life has had, uh, and much of it, in, you know, mo and a great celebration of his achievements and contributions. Um, but, um, uh, I, I think the, before the president had even come into office, really, we were in that phase. I mean, and Becky was bounced in 09 in a f precipitous and abrupt way. Hopes ro rose that Zuma was going to be better. Then Zuma settled into a kind of chaotic drift, uh, which was very inward looking, and, it was, and, and in foreign policy was completely chaotic. There's been a, in the last party cycle, and there's been some efforts at bringing in some new personalities and a little more order to the way that the place is governed, and it sort of remains to be seen how well that goes. Um, uh, the president did have uh, a back in, I, I forget which of the UN General Assembly meetings, it was early on, maybe it was in 2009, there was a, an assembly of half a dozen African heads of state for a luncheon with the president in New York. And Zuma was put at, at the president's elbow uh, deliberately as a way of trying to recharge and reset the relationship and get things going. And apparently that went quite well. I don't know what, what level of communication has happened after that. Um, but um, I think the relationship is fairly, you know, is fairly good, is in fairly good condition at the moment. You know. I don't know, Jennifer, you have any further thoughts? Yeah, I mean, as Steve said, Zuma has been fairly inward looking. You don't have right now on the African continent the big con continental statesman that you did with Obasanjo, with, um, even with Mbeki, although we disagreed with him on many points. Um, and, and yeah, I think the U.S. is often frustrated by, um, by South Africa's foreign policy. Um, but it's but there is a lot that binds us as well, and the idea that they have capacities and they have they're the largest economy, they have a military that's among the most competent and capable. I think trying to move them to play a more uh, more leadership role on the continent in peacekeeping, in peace and security, in 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 diplomacy, and in continental norms, I think is a big big goal. Uh, and, and to your question on the security front, um, I think it will be a backdrop uh, to the, the trip, particularly in Senegal. Senegal is 
uh, part of the Sahel. Uh, it's an important uh, security partner. You know, they've been very vocal in uh, in warning about events in, in Mali and this potential spread of, uh, of the, the groups uh, to other countries in the region. They, uh, although Senegal is a very moderate uh, Muslim country, it does fear the sort of uh, impact that uh, events in the neighbourhood might have in terms of increased militancy at home. So I think uh, talking with Senegal about uh, their contribution to the, the Mali uh, uh, crisis will be important. Uh, in South Africa and, and Tanzania, I don't expect security issues to be that uh, a, a major part of the discussions, but those two countries are the leading uh, contributors to this uh, intervention force that is... Uh, is taking to the field in DRC, you know, uh, a completely new idea, uh, uh, innovation. It will work alongside the UN, but taking uh, offensive operations against uh, the rebel groups in the region. So, as Jennifer said, South Africa is becoming a little bit more assertive in, in playing a, a security and peacekeeping role in the region, and, and that might be part of the discussions there. The other thing, can I just, mm. uh, just quickly add to that, was, is that as the Obama administration doesn't want the military engagement and the drones bases to be the takeaway legacy um, that they have in Africa. And without kind of a countervailing message of economic engagement, democratic engagement, that becomes the most visible uh, and uh, the most visible focus of U.S. engagement. And I think part of this whole trip by focusing on other issues is to say our, our engagement is much larger than the security engagement. And we, and a subtext is we need to be cultivating partners who will be friendly to us, whether it's in the commercial side, the diplomatic side, or ultimately the security um, side as well. Hi, I'm Colleen Nelson with the Wall Street Journal. And um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the how you think Africans will view Obama or view him at this point. You mentioned kind of the reservoir of goodwill in South Africa, but also mentioned that the relationship has stalled in some ways and kind of been in maintenance mode. And I wondered with the high expectations for him, whether you thought that there was frustration that he hadn't engaged more, especially from just kind of on, just on the street. I think there's basically still a lot of goodwill around him. I mean, he's a very engaging personality. I mean, Ghana was, was very well received. Uh, if you look back at uh, Mo Ibrahim's speech um, at the Africa dinner, it was kind of like, you know, brother, come back. We want you. You've just, you know, where are you? Why have you abandoned us? And I think that, that tends to be kind of a common narrative on the street and look out the Chinese are coming I mean, it's it's not um, I don't think there's there's not a great deal of resentment behind it um, kind of at a popular level but a sense of where have you been and in you know I think Nigeria feels very snubbed that he's not visiting uh, Kenya feels very snubbed that he's not visiting them um, so I mean that speaks to a certain affection in, in in some ways you know that said I think there there is this you know the euphoria of what this might mean for Africa has died down and the gradual recognition that he is after all an American president with American interests at, at, at first and foremost on his mind the, um, the South Africans uh, those who focus on foreign policy and, and foreign alignments, they continue to believe that the American relationship is the first or second most important relationship. Um, and, um, and it may have some problematic things that need to be worked, but um, uh, I don't think that has, um, uh, that has changed. I think th um, there's more disappointment in the inattention to Africa among U.S.-based constituencies, I think, than there is within South African-based constituencies. I think I don't think you're going to hear a lot of people in South Africa saying, uh, "Where you been?" I don't know. Maybe you know. I, I just think that there's there's going to be an, an enthusiasm and interest in having having the visit come. It's not going to be the Bush in 2003 where people were just angry and edgy. Uh, I think, the, and and what the messages are going to be. Uh, and, and, and what happens in the bilateral, what if anything happens in the bilateral relationship will be, I think, the thing to watch is 
is this largely a courtesy call or is there some interesting business that gets transacted in the course of it? If it's seen as kind of a drive-by or a courtesy call, then that might leave people feeling like, yeah, it's kind of interesting, but you know, there wasn't a whole lot of stu substance to this, to this stop. Um, as you were saying, a kind of, it, it's a relationship that's, you know, it's, it's a terribly important relationship. It's kind of stalled, but it's not in crisis by any means. And this sort of shores it up and gives it a little bit more vitality. But is there going to be some, some other things that flow out of it? My guess is there will be some modest initiatives that will, that will trail on afterwards. And you could see more travel at cabinet and sub-cabinet level to South Africa and other places in Africa that follow from this because oftentimes these trips do stimulate in the following 12, 18 months a trail of cabinet and sub-cabinet initiatives that are quite important, can be quite important. So a asking, asking, okay, who's going to get the instructions to sort of come back and follow up is, is, is very important, I think. I'll just make one general point that maybe, you know, can't, can't really talk of Africans because Africans are just so many different types of people. But perhaps um, a, a lot of people are, are looking for the U.S. to sort of reflect the changing narrative. You know, um, so much of, uh, uh, of U.S. policy has been, uh, you know, directed towards crisis issues and, and towards the development to, to issues uh, helping the poor and the, and the most uh, needy in Africa. And, and that's help, and, and that's help that's been very important and it's valued. But it's also there's a tone of resentment, perhaps, when you talk to some Africans that, hang on a second, things are changing here, and, and, and maybe you, the U.S. has not made a, a pitch or it's, it hasn't been so relevant to the you know, the, the many other Africans who aren't in abject poverty or, or suffering from warfare and, and abuse, so the, the aspiring middle classes, the consumer class, the urban dwellers, the, uh, the educated, and so on. So perhaps those are constituencies, you know, that uh, the, are the waiting for the U.S. and President Obama to say something that appeals to them and is relevant to their lives. Can I just add one, one additional point to Colleen's question, which is, you know the, the 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 generation of ANC leadership that was in exile, or those that were the exiles who partnered up. And those folks are 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 many of them still in power, but many of them going into retirement and seeing a next generation come forward. That ANC slash Communist Party uh, era of, uh, leadership from the era of struggle and transition harbored very deep resentment of the United States. Uh, we backed the wrong side. Um, uh, they remembered vividly, uh, and um, and it took a lot of effort to overcome that. If you recall, during the Clinton administration, there was the Gore and Becky Commission, right? There were four high-level bilateral commissions established in the Clinton administration to try to, to adjudicate very important, bumpy bilateral relations. It was Ukraine, Russia, South Africa, and I forget what the fourth was. But um, that was to try and deal with these problems. Uh, where does Obama sit? Obama was a, young, was a child when um, these, you know, he, 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 can't, he will not be held to account for any of these mistakes that were made in U.S. policy in those periods. He's free of that just be, by virtue of, of his age and, and where he was and when he was growing up, and, 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 and that's important. I think I don't think he people see him as carrying the, any of that legacy um, at all, and so that's that's a positive thing too. Thank you, Jeff Mason with Reuters. Um, just speaking very broadly, how would you compare Obama's policies on Africa to Bush? Um, and secondly, Jennifer, you mentioned some of the the business initiatives. Are you aware of any particular companies or CEOs who are coming along? Uh, and do you have any other specific ideas of what uh, business initiatives may come? Um, well, the, the Bush administration, had, first of all, um, had kind of a surge of momentum behind it from the Clinton administration, from Congress and, and leaders like Senator Feingold, Senator Kerry, Senator Frist, who, uh, who were uh, the, the constituencies on Sudan, who were all pushing for a much more activist U.S. role in Africa, whether on debt, whether on Sudan, whether on HIV AIDS. Um, he also had more financial wherewithal 
um, to launch these big initiatives. So the $15 billion PEPFAR initiative, the $15 billion MCC, um, made an, er as I said, made a very early commitment on, on Sudan. So it came out of the blocks much faster and with big new ideas and new, new initiatives. Um, President Obama hasn't had that financial and fiscal space to do, to launch big, big issues. Feed the Future was, was you know, his, his signature initiative so far. By its very nature, um, it's, it's a much longer term process to build agricultural development and food security and get policies right versus HIV AIDS where you're giving life-saving treatment to people, bringing them essentially back from the brink of death. That's something that gets Congress excited, it gets the American public excited. Food security, agricultural productivity, agribusiness, that's, that's not quite as sexy and exciting and it takes a lot longer time to, to, to yield results. Um, global health initiative, President Obama tried to take the PEPFAR initiative and kind of use that as a platform to integrate other uh, other health challenges, uh, maternal child health, tuberculosis, and so forth, never quite parlayed in something big and e exciting, um, although that's happening and that's an important thing to happen. So there just hasn't been the money, there hasn't been the excitement, and I don't think there's been the real creative thinking um, about big new initiatives. And as I said, there were there are reasons for that. There were, you know, we were in an economic crisis. Um, we, there were two hot wars going on at the time. Uh, Congress was not going to be up for big new initiatives in Africa. And, you know, to his credit, Obama was able to sustain those big legacy issues throughout a very difficult time in, in, in U.S. domestic scene. Um, so it, it, it doesn't have the same sense of energy or profile or even rhetorical commitment from the president. President Bush actually, you know, as Steve said, you could actually sense a real enthusiasm when he, when he talked about Africa and his Africa trips and his Africa initiatives. And you don't quite get that now. And I think this is President Obama's opportunity to kind of reignite um, not only himself, but Africans and the U.S. bureaucracy and the U.S., uh, various U.S. agencies, cabinet and Congress. I mean, one of the great things of this trip, he's bringing a lot of, a lot of business leaders um, will be accompanying him at, at various spots. Cabinet, le well, we don't know the fullest. It's a huge, you know, at various points he'll be met by, they say, 500 uh, leaders. I think, you know, some of the big ones on it, on the power initiative will be GE, Symbian, Contour Global. Um, um, those are big uh, power generation uh, uh, partners. Um, you know, the, the energy companies perhaps as well. Um, uh, and, and I think a swath of, of smaller scale businesses. I don't think we, we don't have a, a list uh, of any kind. Um, but particularly in Tanzania, I think Symbian has been very big there. GE has, has a number of power projects there as well. Can I just say one thing about on the, on the health and HIV AIDS front? The, um, uh, you know, the, the, the amount of investment in Africa under PEPFAR um, is over $40 billion in the last decade. And it's, and it's an extraordinary achievement. And what, the pres what President Obama did in terms of building upon what President Bush did was he moved the program from being an emergency program to be a, being a sustainable one. He, under Eric Goosby, there were massive efficiencies created by reallocating and redirecting and putting greater scrutiny on how dollars were spent so that under and 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 he actively president obama actively preserved the bipartisan support within congress so that the funding levels have remained f very robust through these very difficult periods but they haven't been rising but we have he made the commitment to go from four million persons on treatment on anti antiretroviral treatments to six million by the end of this year and we are on track to hit that target without so simply by achieving new efficiencies in the use of the dollars. So that is a massive achievement. The other thing that's happened in elaborating upon the Bush legacy was to uh, uh, partner up much more profoundly with the Global Fund, move it through its crisis, 
and step up our engagement, which is now running at about 1.65 billion per year. There's a transition that's underway where our bilateral program will slowly begin to phase down, very slowly, as we move the global fund up. The other thing that Obama has done is enter into these active negotiations around transitions towards the countries assuming much greater uh, responsibilities budgetarily and managerial and the like. And in South Africa is the most advanced dialogue around how and planning around how that's going to happen. Right now, we're putting $480 million a year in South Africa into HIV AIDS programs. We're slated to drop that by 50 percent in about 30 months. It's a, it, and, and, and the planning is very, very active right now on how is the government going to be in a position to fill that gap, take that responsibility, and move forward without any disruptions in services for the people who are dependent upon those life-sustaining therapies. So there's some sensitive, complicated things that Obama administration has moved forward as the logical next phase of a program. So a lot of continuity, but a lot of elaboration and improvement upon what President Bush put in place as an emergency program, and then it's morphed in these various ways. Morning, David Ivanovich with Argus Media. Uh, I think all of you have mentioned Sudan this morning. Um, do you expect the recent flare-up between Sudan and South Sudan to be much of the part of the conversation during this trip? And if so, is there something new the president can or should say about that? Um, I, I don't think it will be a, a big part of the trip, just uh, mainly because of the three countries that he's visiting. It, it's, uh, it's not, I don't think it's just going to come up as one of the big issues. Um, and I, I don't really see much of an opportunity um, for the U.S. either in, 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 in trying to resolve the latest uh, uh, disputes uh, there. Uh, I think the approach will have to be continuing to work through the uh, African Union high-level commission that's uh, that, that's been engaged in, on, in trying to get the two sides to sit around the table and, and work through some of their terms of their divorce. Um, Thabo Mbeki is, is, was due to finish as the head of that uh, that commission. He's been persuaded to, to stay on, um, only on the condition that he gets to tackle some of the internal uh, political and governance issues in both countries that are really at the, the heart of the problem here. Um, but, you know, in terms of U.S. engagement, I don't see much opportunity, particularly in, with, with Khartoum. We still have an ambassador there um, because of sanctions. There's just really not much leverage that we have with the regime. And it's going through this period of <clears throat> complete internal flux at the, at the moment, and it's very hard to know exactly who's in charge and what they're saying. Uh, I see that the invitation to Nafi Ali Nafi, the presidential advisor, who's seen as one of the sort of potential successors to Bashir, who had been invited over here, has now been uh, uninvited because of the latest flare-up between North and South. Uh, he's one of the people that uh, is potentially a successor to Bashir. In fact, the, the ruling party are having their Shura Council to talk about not who they're going to nominate for the next election. I, I just think these internal processes will, will carry on, and, and we don't have much influence over them, frankly. And just to add, um, you know, in the first Obama administration, um, Princeton Ly Ambassador Princeton Lyman was our envoy and was, you know, uh, indefatigable in work, working that circuit and stayed on much longer than he had um, hoped or planned, stepped down sometime in the early part of this year, February or March, has not been replaced. The envoy has an, a, a replacement. There's the constituents here are clamoring for that. But it has no decision's been taken. Uh, instead, what you see is the fine gold thing that I referenced, which is part of the Great Lakes. Um, uh, the other thing I'd, I'd point out is that Secretary Kerry, uh, during the first Obama administration, while he, while in the Senate and as chair of SF, as a Senate Foreign Relations Committee, played a very integral role uh, during the uh, referendum process and the transition and the negotiations over these. You know, when the oils got stopped and things got ugly. He was in the region uh, uh, recurrently uh, uh, at playing a facilitative role, and, and it was a very important role because statutorily our envoy could not engage because of sanctions directly with um, the Bashir government. So he had to do workarounds, and, and it was Secretary Kerry, then Senator Kerry, who played a very important role. So you have considerable expertise and knowledge within 
uh, within the Secretary of State's office himself around all of this and his, uh, his uh, Shannon Smith, who's, sta who's now a DAS in the Africa Bureau. But um, I agree with what Richard said. I don't think this is going to figure much in the, in the trip. It's a, it's, a, it's a problem area. It's where we have U.S. interest, where our level of engagement is just sort of slow, the, slowly kind of diminishing. Air is going a little bit out of the constituencies on the issue because it's gotten a lot more complicated than the old narrative of an evil Khartoum and a, a victim South. And the, the Southern government is having, is mirroring a lot of the behaviors of the North right now. And there's internal problems in the South, corruption issues, transparency issues, governance issues. And it's just become a much more uh, thorny issue that doesn't lend itself to big public and congressional attention. It looks like a lot of that advocacy focus is moving towards Eastern DRC um, at this point. Nedra. Hi, it's Nedra Pickler with the AP. We've talked a little bit about what to expect in his stops in Tanzania and in South Africa, but I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about Senegal, what um, the challenges are there and the issues and anything that you might expect that he'll be talking about there. I think Senegal would be a natural place to speak to the democracy and institution building agenda. Um, Senegal, as I said at, at the start, came through something of an electoral crisis last year. President Wad, who had been in power for, for quite a while, tried to extend his term, worked through the Constitutional Court to get them, allowed, uh, get them to allow him to extend his term. There's a lot of controversy over that, whether that was constitutional or not. Um, his son had been uh, appointed ministry, minister of the three major major uh, ministries, uh, transport, interior, and, and energy, I think, um, was accused of, of corruption. There was also allegations that he was setting his son up to be his successor. Um, despite all that, there was a major public outcry from opposition groups who came together in an umbrella group youth movements, you know, a hip hop scene, the Yana Mar, kind of a, a youth movement. Um, so it was a, a, it was peaceful ultimately, but it was a real public mobilization. And I think, I think, you know, an illustration that, you know, a leader is not as powerful as his, his people. Um, and, and so I think he'll speak to that. He'll speak to the youth issues and the power of youth, me, youth and social media and public participation in these issues. You know, the, the consolidation of democratic norms and principles. Um, and I think that's where he will probably make that speech. Now, also Senegal, as, as Richard said, you know, is vulnerable to spillover from the conflict in the Sahel. Senegal has one of the more professional and competent militaries in Africa, even though it's a small country. Um, they pl they've played a critical diplomatic role within ECOWAS, the West African Regional Grouping, whether it's on diplomatic crises in Cote d'Ivoire, in Liberia, in Mali now. Um, and that may be a stop also to, to kind of give kudos to ECOWAS as having you know, still, still building, but has having played this vital regional role in diplomacy and now in peacekeeping in, in Mali. Um, that's kind of in stark contrast to SADC, which has been on and off in terms of its activism in, in, in dealing with Zimbabwe, for example. Um, and I think, I think the idea of African regional groupings kind of taking fuller responsibility for both security and democracy and governance will be a theme there as well, because it's a place where there's some good examples to, to point to. Uh, yeah. I think you said it all, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the Gore historical dimension is, you know, very important. I mean, Clinton went there, Bush went there, Obama's going there. It's a touchstone. It's a safe place. It, there's, it's, when you look at West Africa and you ask yourself, what are the alternatives? There's a couple of, there's maybe one or two other places you might consider seriously. But, um, and they did actually commit, didn't they commit a contingent battalion 
to the first Gulf War. There was, if you go back and look at the relation, security relationship with the Senegalese, stretches back two decades in terms of collaboration, and our train and equip relationship has been fairly strong. Um, the IMET program, it's it's a it's a it's been a pretty strong collaborative uh, on the security grounds on peacekeeping relationship going back two decades. And in fact, uh, both Tanzania and Senegal are big uh, Millennium Challenge account recipients. Tanzania has the biggest compact um, and is up now for a second tranche. Um, uh, Senegal, there were some problems with the, with the implementation of MCC early on, having to do in part with Karim Wad, um, the corrupt son of the, of, of the president. Um, but that would be something to look at as well there. My worry is, is less about China's behavior than about the leaders with whom it engages. And I think, you know, something that we tend to miss in our lectures to China and our fears about China is that, you know, ultimately it's up to the African governments to set the terms of the engagement. And whether it's on environmental due diligence, whether it's on transparency, um, whether it's on a level playing field for various actors, um, employment standards, safety regulations in mines in Zambia, those are for the partner governments to set and to enforce. So China, at various times, it's being pushed back by African governments. In South Africa, after the unions protested the influx of cheap manufactured goods and textiles, the unions protested and the government ultimately imposed a, a two-year quota a, a, quota on, on Chinese imported goods. Um, in Gabon, you know, environmental protesters protesting the lack of d due diligence on, on some of the Chinese oil companies' exploration in a national park got a moratorium put until the actual due diligence was done. In Zambia, you know, the mining accidents and safety regulations became a major political issue. And the, and the president in Zambia right now, a big part of his platform was in saying, we have to harness how the Chinese do business here. So this, in case after case, where governance push, China will, China will go along. I mean, it will go, it will play by the rules of the game. It's just that in those cases of a of a Democratic Republic of Congo or, or, or Guinea or, or certain other places where the governance is not focused on, you know, on transparency and, and the, the national good, um, it can be problematic. And it's problematic whether it's China or whether it's any other international investor that's not going to wanting to abide by, by the, the regulations. I mean, the United States does have um, – you know, fairly stringent Foreign Corrupt Practices Act that has been much more active now <laughs> in, in pursuing cases in Africa over the last years. I mean, so, so there are some constraints that U.S. companies have that Chinese companies may not have. But ultimately, and I think Africans are realizing this, African governments and African publics and African entrepreneurs are realizing it's really up to us. Uh, we, have, we have the minerals. We have the thing. We have the, the goods that China wants. How do we structure that to our, uh, to, to our benefit? And you'll, you'll hear in this, the, the central bank in Nigeria and, and others saying, you know, this, this whole issue of processing and getting some value added while the goods are in the country. So the beneficiation in country is an increasing kind of uh, chorus in, in Africa rather than seeing goods, whether it's to China, India, Malaysia, or anywhere else, just leave the continent in raw form and get processed someplace else. So One thing, oh, excuse me. No, that's it. One thing to think about is the impact of, of Chinese influence in places like the Security Council and other deliberations. The, 
uh, and how its influence plays out with respect to votes by the African members on things that really matter to us, like Syria or Iran or North Korea. Um, keep in mind, um, the uh, Chinese entry into into the UN in the early 70s was was uh, 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 largely driven forward by their success at luring an, a very strong African vote in their favor. And, um, and that went back to all sorts of solidarity ties forged in the 60s between China and, and, and um, um, various, a variety of movements seeking to move into a post-colonial uh, world. And so there's, an, there's a long tradition of seeing the engagement in Africa as very effective, uh, as working to promote Chinese interests and, and, a, and a fairly cheap date, and, and, it, and it works. And, um, and it's still a, a very important dimension um, when you look at some of the, I any of the most sensitive vote, votes that, or decisions that come before the Security Council to look, if, if we're in opposition, if we're in opposition with the Chinese, you can bet we're spending a lot of time sweating over whether we can deliver the African votes with us. Great. I, um, I wanted to ask one final question. Um, Jennifer, you alluded earlier to um, some awareness of the NSA data surveillance issues uh, in Africa. Um, you all just got back from Europe in the G8 where there, some of those issues were front and center. Do you expect that to be part of this trip? I think in uh, – I tend to think particularly in South Africa that will come up um, where kind of the level of awareness of that is is high, where there is a tendency to – you know, view the United States through the prism of kind of great imperial power. Um, you know that that is true in other parts of Africa, but in in South Africa in particular, I think it's it's particularly strong. Same with cr criticism of of drone policies and and so forth. I think some of that is less controversial in the Sahel in West Africa, in East Africa, where actually the terror threat is a much more direct threat to those countries themselves, um, as South Africa is somewhat removed and insulated from that. Um, but there also is this uh, the slightly knee-jerk reaction to U.S. unilateralism, U.S. imperial power, and, and these kinds of programs. So I think it will, it will come up in public debate in South Africa in a big way. Well, thank you all for coming today. We will have a uh, transcript out uh, later today by close of business. That will go out by email. Uh, it will also be posted on the CSIS website. Thank you so much for uh, joining us here at CSIS this morning.